Is Tamara home? I think you have the wrong trailer. Tamara, can you call your fucking friend, please? The bitch is going crazy trying to find you. So the Strangers Pray at Night tells the story of a family staying the night at a relative's trailer park when three masked psychopaths terrorize them through the night. So I gotta get this out first. I have never been a fan of the first Strangers. I've always found it to be very overrated. Haven't seen it since it came out like 10 or so years ago. So I watched it this afternoon after getting back from the movie theater. And I gotta say, I still think this movie is incredibly mediocre and incredibly overrated. So what do I think about the sequel, Pray at Night? First off, the main difference between The Strangers and The Strangers Pray at Night is that Pray at Night goes much more in the classic slasher territory. The first one's pretty much home invasion with a little bit of slasher elements thrown in there. Pray at Night's basically all slasher. And lucky for me, that is much more up my alley than the first one. So starting right off with the positives, we'll just keep talking about that. The way that they take the directions of this sequel into going much more in the classic throwback slasher territory, I really enjoyed that. It was a nice little surprise. It's a good breath of fresh air for us slasher fans that hardly ever get slashers anymore, at least any good ones. You get all these little B-movies and shit on VOD and everything that most of the time aren't very good. But a major release slasher is very few and far between nowadays, so it's nice to see one actually come out that's good. Dad? And I think that slasher element actually makes the villains, the strangers, a little bit more effective in this sequel. You know, it's this huge, vast, open trailer part, which is another positive, is the setting that they use. But it's still blockaded with fence and razor wire, and the strangers have done things to kind of barricade this family into this little trailer park funhouse, if you will. So even though it's this big, vast, open environment where they could literally be anywhere, it still feels very tight-knit and claustrophobic, which is kind of cool. And as far as the villains themselves, I really like the masks. I really like how the strangers are kind of like these psychopathic slasher killers that don't necessarily want to get all the fun out of the way in the first five minutes. They kind of want to toy with their victims and scare the shit out of them and fuck with them mentally and just hear them scream and run around praying, please, somebody get us out of here for hours on end before they finally stick the knife in, that's a nice little breath of fresh air too. And luckily a good thing about this movie too is that a thing that's not very common in slasher movies is the protagonist characters are very likable and mostly really well acted, one in particular. But whenever you get into the movie and it starts getting going, it feels like it kind of takes its time getting to the actual slasher elements and actually introducing the strangers, but it doesn't feel like it's taking forever to get there in a negative way. It's like it's building its characters, it's kind of setting up the family dynamic and you know the, the struggles between the mom and the daughter and the father and the daughter and a little bit of sibling rivalry between the sister and the brother. And it kind of makes you feel for this family, makes it feel like they're a real family. And so whenever the terror starts, you actually want them to survive and you kind of have a little bit of external drama too because whenever somebody gets killed or gets attacked or whatever, you kind of know all of the unfinished business and all of the internal conflicts that these characters have within each other that are never going to be resolved now. I appreciate those little elements that they put into protagonists. You guys know I've been reviewing the Friday the 13th movies for the past, you know, four or five weeks and you know, most of those characters and in most traditional slashers as well are very just box cutter, cookie cutter characters that are just thrown on there with, you know, caricatures and very little storyline or personality whatsoever just so the killer can get to them. It's nice whenever you get a slasher that they actually take the time to put storyline and personality and some drama into their protagonist before the killing starts. And it helps that the acting ability of the protagonist is actually pretty good too. You see like probably the most recognizable face is Christina Hendricks. You've seen her in Mad Men and Firefly and a couple other things. She's very good as the mom. But the daughter, played by Bailey Madison, who ends up being pretty much your main protagonist throughout the movie and the one that has the most focus on the storyline as far as that internal conflict of the family that I was talking about, she does really good. And I recognized this girl for a minute. I'm like, what do I know her from? And the last thing I saw her from was whenever she was bitching out Tobey Maguire in Brothers. And she is really good in this. Because, you know, people don't give actors and actresses that play in horror movies and slashers and everything like that enough credit. I mean these actors have to convey fear and hyperventilating and crying and out of breath for take after take after take after take for two-thirds of the runtime at least in most of these movies. That takes a lot of acting ability. 
And this girl really nails it because anytime she seems like she's scared or in pain or you know traumatized by what's going on, you believe her, it comes through the screen. So again, very, very high point that the acting is good in the protagonist, which also, just like their storylines and their tight-knit family dynamic, it makes you feel for them and it makes you want them to survive and that's very important for an effective slasher. But we've just started. I also enjoy the fact that this sequel seems to have a lot more fun with its concept than the first movie. The first movie feels very scaled down and very serious and very minuscule as far as what it puts on screen, almost like a independent film or a, a student film in some ways. Whenever you get to Pray at Night, it's much more of a kind of a bigger, louder, and flashier sequel, and it makes for a much more fun viewing experience, at least as far as I'm concerned. Keep in mind, I didn't like the first one, so if you love the first one, that might be a weird little transition for you, but whenever I saw the sequel, I was having a lot more fun watching The Strangers. And finally, I really like the movie's use of music. There's a lot of 80s music in this. Some of the sequences, especially in the third act, that are these long, drawn-out, kind of extended sequences of battling or you know, somebody being killed or a lot of carnage going on. They have some song that just feels like it shouldn't be in a sequence like that, but it fits so strangely well that it actually works. There's a lot of moments like that in this movie from the credits, from the opening, all the way through to the final act that I actually enjoyed. And it kind of, it breaks up the feeling of the movie and again, kind of adds to that more fun, kind of laid back and enjoyable feel of this sequel overall, in my opinion. Now, with all that being said, it's not a perfect movie. I did have some serious issues with a couple of things. Mainly is just the writing. Now, I had a big issue with the writing in Strangers. I have a gigantic pet peeve with that horror classic cliche that all of your protagonist characters have to make the dumbest fucking decisions possible. And like in the first one, whenever they're getting ready to pull out in the car and the truck pulls behind them and they have plenty of room to drive around them and just go on and live happy lives, but they get out of the car and run like all of a sudden they have no options. Shit like that, unfortunately, is doubled down in this sequel. There are so many moments in this movie where it's blatantly obvious that there is a salvation within a certain decision that it is maddening that the characters do not take that route and they go to something else like hiding or going running through the woods when there's a fucking working vehicle right there or holding a gun point blank to one of the strangers and be completely incapable of pulling the motherfucking trigger. There's even a sequence in this movie where a character is about to be killed and they are more than capable of defending themselves to a certain degree and they put forth zero effort to defend themselves at all. It's like they just kind of accept their fate while they're crying and all this kind of stuff. Even though they could do something to stop the person that's about to fucking stab them, stuff like that, it drives me insane. It's a pet peeve of mine, I understand, that might just be to me. Some people love that cliche classic elements of slashers. Me personally though, I just feel like it cheapens the slasher genre. You hear so many people saying, I hate slashers, I hate horror movies because people do stupid decisions and this and that. It's like all that dialogue in the original Scream and you can't argue it when you have stuff like this. When you see a movie and there's so many good opportunities for good sequences that would still make sense and have these characters be really smartly written and they choose to just kind of go the cheap route and just say, oh, just ignore all this stupid shit. It's just a slasher movie. I just, I refuse to get behind that. I refuse to. <laughs> And the only other two negatives I have are honestly pretty minuscule. The one that I just got done ranting on was actually my biggest problem with the movie because it was just driving me nuts throughout. As much fun as I was having, it was just irking the fuck out of me. The next decision that they made that I really didn't agree with, there's a sequence where you actually get to see the face of one of the strangers, and I feel like that was a mistake. You know, one of the elements that I thought was really effective about the original strangers is that you never get to see who these three people are. And they have a lot of those elements in this movie too, certain sequences where they try to take the mask off but they don't get it off, or you know, the doll face character is at the door and all the shadow is covering her face, and all of those elements I feel like works for these characters to where you shouldn't see what they look like. 
So whenever it got to that point when you get to see one of the characters' faces, it just kind of felt like a letdown to me. It felt like it was unnecessary, and I'm not really sure why they did that. They could have even just turned the camera around and had the same exact scene play out without that character's face being shown, and I feel like it would have been much more effective. Seems like a small detail, but for these characters, to me, it feels like a pretty big flub. And the last element that just annoyed me slightly is just, honestly, it's not even this movie's fault, it's just the craze going on right now. I feel like the 80s craze that kind of gets injected into this sequel feels a little bit tacked on and a little bit unnecessary. Now, we're going through, ever since Stranger Things, everybody's all about the 80s. Now, I love the 80s. I love 80s movies, I love 80s pop culture, 80s music, all about the 80s. But now that it seems like every movie has to kind of inject that because everybody loves Stranger Things and some other movies that did it well, it feels a little bit like it's getting to be annoying, at least for me personally. A lot of the 80s stuff in this movie actually feels like it was done in post-production. Like somebody just made the decision last minute, hey, you know what, let's add an 80s element to this. Let's throw 80s soundtrack music into this. And in the 80s references and nostalgia and the style that they put into this with you know most of the music, Honestly, it just feels so minuscule that I almost wish they would have went all or nothing. Either kept the 80s stuff out of it and made this a all the way modern movie with modern music and a modern feel and modern vibe, or go balls out and have like maybe it's set in the 80s or you know have a lot of 80s title cards or you know have a little bit more fun with it now that they're going for that more fun angle of the slashers. I wish it would have been one of those elements because even though I really enjoy the musical elements that they put into with like you know, total eclipse of the heart and songs like that in the third act with some of these extended sequences. It worked really well in those sequences, but throughout the movie before that, it felt like it was really forced. Every single time a radio turned on, it was an 80s classic song. But other than that, guys, I actually enjoyed this movie. I thought it was a good time at the theaters. It was a nice little breath of fresh air and a nice little tasty nugget for a slasher fan like myself that we actually have a good, legit slasher movie out in theaters to check out. To me, it was an improvement over the original movie, although there's a ton of people that love The Strangers that probably will not agree with me and may not even like the sequel at all because it's so different. But for me, much more enjoyable, much more appealing to myself. So if you're a fan of The Strangers or just a fan of the slasher genre, definitely get your ass out there and support horror, baby. Check this thing out in theaters at a matinee. So what did you guys think of The Strangers Pray at Night? Do you prefer The Strangers or Pray at Night? Did you enjoy The Strangers? Did you enjoy the sequel? Put all of your love and hate for both movies down in the comment section below, guys, and we will talk about it. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. If you want to check out some of my social media links, you can check out the video description below for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, my Patreon page, which is a great way to give back to this channel and get exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron, and my new Spreadshirt store. I have four designs up right now for t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, water bottles, all kinds of cool stuff. It's got 15% off, I think, for like maybe the next one or two days, so act fast, people. Check out this store, please. I think you're gonna enjoy these shirts. And be sure to send me a picture on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anywhere, once you actually receive your Cody Leach apparel and you will be in a future video once I get a nice little collection of pictures of all you beautiful faces. So check all that out, guys. If you wanna check out some more of my videos, you can check out a few more by clicking right over here.